welcome to Gashley United Methodist Church. I am Jen, one of the pastors here, and I'm excited to be with you today. We are jumping into our second week of Advent, and uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit today about scripture from Luke. So Luke is one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And today we will be talking about Luke 1, 24 through 45. The Christmas season is such a, a celebration all around us. We see commercials and movies and print ads and, and hosted events where they're celebrating the holiday season. Now everyone looks so happy, right? From gift giving to wonderfully tasty holiday food and parties to tree lightings and decorating to family returning home, the excitement really is filling the air. But for some people, the holidays do not hold that joy and excitement. And for a very long time, uh, I was one of those people. My mom passed away on New Year's Eve night uh, 23 years ago. So this time of year brought um, a lot of sadness for me because I was reminded of the very last Christmas that I had with my mom and what had transpired the week between Christmas and New Year's Eve. Her death, the impending funeral, and dealing with the state and sale of her home. And I felt guilty for feeling sad as everyone around me was jovial and filled with excitement and uh, couldn't wait for snow to come and trees to go up. But I just felt really lost and I felt a lot of sadness and immense grief. And I just wanted to be alone and away from everyone, left to my own thoughts and my grief. And I know that I'm not the only one who has ever felt like this around Christmas or maybe even any other holiday. Whether traumatic events uh, around the holidays or a loss of a loved ones, sometimes we're just not in the Christmas spirit that everyone really wants us to be in. People who do not understand this will try to help by saying, time heals all wounds, or your loved one would want you to be happy or celebrate, or this too shall pass, or I'm sure they're happy and celebrating up in heaven. And though I think people generally think they're being helpful, it isn't very helpful to the person that it is said to. Sometimes we just need to say to someone who is in this position, I don't understand what you're going through, but I'm here to walk with you through it. When we're weary, we find, we find it hard to express joy. Reverend Cecilia Armstrong suggests that when we're weary, we might find it hard to share space with others because our weariness has seeming, seemingly stolen our joy. However, it, it is even possible, or is it even possible to be our joy filled? 
by ourselves. While we want to honor the ways our joy can expand when it's shared with others, we also want to be mindful of all those who may be experiencing loneliness and isolation throughout the holidays, or those who are deeply missing a loved one. Therefore, it is, it is important to emphasize the joy, the joy is fundamentally rooted in connection. But connection expands beyond just human relationships. Sure, there are things we can do that will bring us joy, but, but what external joy is possible without others to acknowledge it? Could it be that internal joy can only be actualized in external connections? Shared joy is, is one way that a weary world can rejoice. So in Luke, we find Elizabeth alone for five months. There's no indication in the text that explains her isolation, but speculation offers that her isolation was due to the same reason Zechariah was silenced. Elizabeth probably had a lot of questions. Can we speculate what those questions might have been? Does the Lord know how old I am might have been one? We've been wanting children for a while and now we're pregnant might have been one. Or the shame of being barren has caused me to be weary. So how am I supposed to rejoice with this? We don't hear her questions, but we hear her resolve in verse 25. This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. Now we're not sure about Mary's travels. Mary sets out with haste to enter the house of Zechariah and greet Elizabeth. We don't know if she traveled alone, but we do know she went on a mission to get clarity about her own encounter with Gabriel. Creative thinking suggests that Mary did all of this on her own in isolation by herself with no one to help hurt or hinder her mission. We don't hear her questions either. We hear her question Gabriel wondering how this can be uh, since she is a virgin, but we don't hear her internal dialogue during her travels. Imagination says, does the Lord know how young I am? I haven't even been married yet and now I'm pregnant. The shame of being with with child without being married first has caused me to be weary. So how am I supposed to rejoice with this? We don't hear her questions much like Elizabeth, but we witness her resolve by seeing her travel to her relative. Just think about this for a second. Two pregnant women meeting and sharing their experiences with one another, chatting, hanging out, two pregnant women who are related but surely different from one another. One is young, one is old, one is married, one is not married, one is carrying the word of God, and one is carrying the one who prepares the way. They were both separate when they got news of God's plans for their lives. It is when they're connected though that they experience shared joy. It is when they come out of their isolation that joy becomes the connection. If comfort is a necessity in this weary world, then rejoicing should be done in the company of others. Mary and Elizabeth have, they really have shown us that joy in joining and comfort in connecting. In her book, Atlas of the Heart, researcher Dr. Brene Brown defines joy as an intense feeling of deep spiritual connection, pleasure, or appreciation. She says joy is characterized by a connection with others or with God or nature or the universe. Therefore, connection is fundamental to experiences of joy. Consider a time when you experienced deep joy. Who or what did you feel connected to when you have experienced contagious joy? When the angel visits Mary, his first word is rejoice. Why is Mary initially skeptical of the angel's joyful greeting? Does she fear she's being tricked? When have you been skeptical of an expression of joy and why? 
In the women's lectionary, Dr. Will Gaffney translates Luke 1 through 1, 20, verse 24, excuse me, to, and she hid herself for five months, arguing that the language for Elizabeth's seclusion is strong and should be translated in a way that expresses that. Why do you think Elizabeth isolated herself? Maybe she was experiencing foreboding joy, consumed with worry that something terrible would happen. Maybe she was protecting herself from the scrutiny of her neighbors. As an older woman, she was she having difficulty with her pregnancy? Was she, like Zechariah, in a season of spiritual solitude, wanting to go inward to prepare for the birth of her son? We experience joy through feeling a deep connection to ourselves and our loved ones, to God, to nature, and to the whole cosmos that surrounds us. And as we look to the gospel text, many sermons may emphasize how Elizabeth provides sanctuary for Mary. But I would like to suggest a different angle. Perhaps Mary's arrival is what pulls Elizabeth out of her seclusion, allowing her to experience joy and delight. And we want to highlight the mutuality of their joy. Even if they cannot, each cannot feel joy in themselves, they are both holding joy for each other. From that connection, joy grows. According to tradition, Elizabeth and Zechariah lived in the Judean hill country, and their home was about five miles west of Jerusalem and 80 miles from Nazareth. Contemplate the many hardships of this journey by foot, especially for someone who was pregnant. What compelled Mary to go to Elizabeth? What kept her going? In Luke 1 verse 45, the Greek word for happy or blessed is makarios, which means fortunate, and was often used to describe the rich who enjoyed good fortune and carefree lifestyles. Consider the irony of this word being uh, attributed to Mary, a self-described low-status servant. This is the same word used in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, blessed are the peacemakers, Contrast the meaning of makarios with the Greek word for joy, Cairo, which is used several times throughout our series. Does this help you refine your own definitions of happiness and joy, and how are they different? Their stories and experiences are vastly different between Mary and Elizabeth, but Mary sought out her kin, and this reminds me that we do not need to do hard things alone. There is some power in connection. And women, so often overlooked or ignored, both in society at large and in biblical narratives, have the only speaking roles in this vignette. Mary's first words prompt this uh, immediate, silent response from Elizabeth's unborn child. John leaps, we're told acknowledging both her presence and the significance of the child she carries in her womb. And John's reaction to Mary's voice fulfills Gabriel's prophecy. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Already John pointing to the coming one. And though Luke clearly signals that the unborn child's leaping is prompted by the Spirit, it is Elizabeth, John's mother, who takes on the role of prophet by, by speaking the prophetic word in the scene. She's filled with the Holy Spirit and proclaims what Mary has not yet told her and what is not yet visible to the eye. Mary is pregnant. Furthermore, through the Spirit, she knows who Mary's child will be, for she calls Mary the mother of the Lord. Her prophecy will soon be fulfilled when her own son prepares the way for the Lord. Now, Elizabeth not only prophesies, prophesies, but blesses. By declaring Mary and the fruit of Mary's womb blessed, she begins a series of blessings that weave through Luke's birth narrative and intensify its tone of joy and delight and praise. And Mary is blessed not only for her status as the mother of the Lord, but also for her trust in God's promise. 
Mary is blessed because despite all expectations, her social status has been reversed. She will be honored rather than shamed for bearing this child. She's also been blessed with divine joy, with beatitude, because she has believed that God is able to do what God promises to do. And when Elizabeth says, blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord, she implicitly con contrasts Mary's trust in God's power and promise with her own husband, Zechariah's skeptical questioning. And Zechariah asked for proof that the angel's word was true. And Mary asked for an explanation of what was going to happen to her and then gave her willing consent. Zechariah, the religious professional, doubted God. But Mary, the peasant girl, believed. And her trust in God's word opened the door for God to bless her and to bless the whole world through her. And Elizabeth celebrates Mary's willingness to say yes to God. By greeting Mary with honor, Elizabeth overturns social expectations. Mary is this unmarried pregnant woman. She might expect social judgment and shame and even ostracism from her older kinswoman. Yet Elizabeth knows from her own experience the cost of being shamed and excluded. In her culture, a woman's primary purpose in life is to bear children. So as an elderly and fertile wife, she had endured a lifetime of being treated as a failure. And her response to her miraculous pregnancy emphasizes that God's grace has reversed her social status too. This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. And at long last, in her old age, she is an honorable married woman pregnant with her husband's son. And Elizabeth continues the pattern of social reversal by opening her arms and her home to her, to her relative, whom her neighbors would expect her to reject. And instead of shaming Mary, she welcomes and blesses and celebrates her, treating her as more honorable than herself. Thus, the pregnancy might have brought Mary shame, brings her joy and honor now. And when Elizabeth welcomes Mary, she practices the same kind of inclusive love that Jesus will show to outcasts and sinners. She sees beyond the shamefulness of Mary's situation to the reality of God's love at work, even among those whom society rejects and excludes. Now, the last almost 10 years, I have chosen to spend my time of grief with others and to be happy when they experience joy around the holiday season, whether it's with my family, my extended family, my friends, or even my church family. I lean on my community. May we, like Elizabeth and Mary, trust that through connection, our weary may be joy. In community, our joy expands, and when we can't rejoice, we can carry each other's joy. May we, like them, become a community that supports each other as we hope and as we wait. Amen. Go in peace.